Okay, well, let's just ask uh, the Lord for his blessing uh, on this message as we uh, go through Psalm 139. Father, we uh, just commit ourselves to you now and uh, pray your blessing on uh, this little word that we may be encouraged from your scriptures. And we confess, Father, how often we need encouragement as we uh, walk through this uh, wilderness with its trials, its testings, uh, realizing our own weakness within and the enemy without. So we just uh, commit it to you that the Holy Spirit would help us to uh, glean something from this for our hearts, also for our understandings. We just uh, ask thy blessing now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I'll open your Bible to uh, Psalm 110. Uh, some of my previous messages uh, this time around have a little on the uh, theological side, doctrinal. I guess you could say that's okay. We need that. This is a little more um, devotional, practical, I think. Psalm 139. At least that's the way I'm going to take it up. Um, but the, the doctrinal side of things, of course, and the objective side of things is important because if if we lose sight of that, then we don't know why we're being practical or devotional at some point, right? And so uh, the objective truth is always first, it's foundational, and then the subjective application. But I'm not going to go down that line today, Just I just mentioned that as we take up the, the psalm. Because it's dealing with the state of a soul, state of soul of a believer, albeit uh, an Old Testament saint, uh, but there are um, areas where there's commonality. Uh, not everything here hits the height of our position uh, in Christ as revealed in the New Testament. Yet there's commonalities and, and these things were all written for our learning and for our profit, for our correction, for instruction and righteousness, Paul tells us. So when we look at Psalm 139, a Psalm of David, we might want to back up to verse 8, the last verse of Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verse 8, F.W. Grant points out that because of, there is a definite sequence of Psalms, a definite chronological order in which the Holy Spirit has set them, unlike the arrangement, for example, of the books of the New Testament, or even many of the books of the Old Testament, they're not always arranged uh, chronologically, chronologically, but uh, in the Psalms, in the five books of the Psalms, there is an arrangement. And and so uh, verse 8 is sort of introductory to uh, Psalm 139. And it says, it also is a Psalm of David, and it, it says there that the Lord, that is Jehovah, Yahweh, will perfect, uh, that word can be translated, uh, accomplish, and the New American Standard uh, translates it accomplished, or it can be translated complete. Uh, complete. Uh, that Yahweh, Jehovah, will complete or accomplish or perfect that which concerns me. Uh, your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work, works of your hands. So we see right here, uh, first off, uh, what is going to be presented in Psalm 139. It's, it's the story of the exercise, soul exercise of a saint in the Old Testament in God's dealings with him and, and the searchings of God in his heart. Uh, but as I mentioned, it doesn't actually always hit the height of Christian position. As we see at the very end of verse 8, it says, Do not forsake the work of your hands. Well, um, a Christian would, would know that... Um, and would see and understand that we are in Christ um, and none of his own will ever be lost, right? Um, that we're kept forever, that we're secure in Christ. Um, but we can take this as a practical uh, statement as well, a plea, a cry, you know, for the Lord's continued work in the life. Uh, and I connect this with um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Where Paul says, being confident of this very thing, right, this very one thing, uh, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it under the day of, of Jesus Christ. So we can take it up that way. 
God has begun a work in us. Salvation is, is our, our standing. Uh, we're in Christ right from the beginning of, of faith in him. But there ought to be growth, you know, practical sanctification, the exercises of soul, and so on. And, and God is working. Paul said in Philippians, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, for it is God which works in you, he goes on to say. Uh, so we're not working for our salvation, but we're working out our salvation. You can only work out what is already in. Okay, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you. Paul's saying, I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm in prison. I'm going to be martyred probably. And so now you will not have me anymore. But don't worry about that. Uh, you need to work out your own salvation. And, and don't worry, because it was God that was working in you all along, right? We're not dependent upon men or a man. We're dependent upon God. And so when we come to uh, Psalm 139, verse 1, well-known verse, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. The word search there uh, is, um, means examine, examine or examination, like uh, to examine thoroughly or intimately, when one examines something thoroughly or intimately. And, and so David says, oh, Lord, you have examined me thoroughly and intimately. Uh, the Lord knows us. Uh, you know, he could say, the Lord Jesus said to some that in that day that the Lord will say to them, uh, depart from me, O workers of iniquity, I, iniquity, I never knew you. Well, doesn't he know all things? Is he not uh, omniscient? Yes. And so he knows about the wicked and he knows about the righteous. But in the context there, to know when the Lord knows us, it means he has a relationship with us. There's that intimate connection. And I should say that the psalm is actually divided up into four parts. There's four natural parts uh, of six verses each. So there's 24 verses in total. So verse 1 to 6 the subject is the omniscience of God. This is what we're speaking about here in verse 1. And, and onwards to up to the end of verse 6. The omniscience of God. That means he's all-knowing. You know, omniscience, uh, it's a big word. It's, it's two words. Omni, you know, uni, it's Latin, universal, or all. And science, our English word science. Uh, we're familiar with that is what that is. Uh, it's knowledge, okay? So it's all knowledge, all knowing. And then verse 7 to 12, the, the, the next six verses, it's about his omnipresence. That is, God is everywhere. We know he's in heaven. Heaven is a literal place, an actual place. Uh, but he's also everywhere. In him we live and move and have our being. That's not pantheism, but God's presence is everywhere. And then verses 13 to 18 is God's omnipotence, that he's all-powerful. And then the final, the closing verse, six verses, verse 19 to 24, we get uh, David's obeisance, that is his, his turning up to God. It's a prayer, really, verse 19 to verse 24. And there's two parts to the prayer. We'll look at that when we come to it. So we're dealing now with the first six verses, and it's the omniscience of God, his all-knowingness. He knows all things. He knows all about us. Because it's very personal here. It's very, um, you know, uh, it just, it's just not a fact, right, that David's state, stating. It's something that's very personal uh, to him. Uh, oh, Lord, you have searched me, examined me thoroughly and intimately, and known me. Okay? Um, and then he gives some um, descriptive words here that sort of highlight this. Uh, the searchings of God and being known by God. Uh, I'm reading now from the New King James as the main text, but I'll refer to some other translations as we go through, just so we can understand the Hebrew, what the Hebrew says. But verse 2 and 3, uh, we get, You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. And so there's quite a bit in this in this little uh, uh, run of verses here, and so I want to unpack it just a little bit. First of all, again, I want to stress the personal side of this, the, um, 
uh, David's just not speaking generally. He's speaking personally. Notice the use of the word my. Uh, six times my. My sitting down. My rising up. My thought afar off. My path. My lying down. Uh, my ways. So it's, you know, it's my, my, my. You know, so uh, God has known all of this about us. And I like how the, the Holy Spirit uses different words here to describe this, right? Uh, you know my sitting down. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path. You are acquainted with all my ways. In fact, we can break that down a little more, you know, uh, uh, more descriptively uh, in the um, in the New American Standard. Uh, it says, you know, when I sit down, uh, you understand my thought of, from afar. Um, you scrutinize. It has the word scrutinize here. And that's that's good word to describe this Hebrew word. The New King James has under uh, has um, um, rather has a comprehend. But it means to it, it's a it's a farming word like winnowing. Right. You have you have winnowed my path, you know, sorted it. Uh, just like when they separate the wheat from the chaff, you know, like the Lord Jesus could say to Simon Peter, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. So God allowed this in Peter's life, the sifting of Satan, okay? Uh, but the Lord was in control, okay? He was, he was dealing with Peter. Uh, and so, so the, and the other one here too is the, the New American Standard has at the end of verse 3, and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Um, the New King James just says, um, you are acquainted with my ways, but the idea is you are intimately acquainted. So we saw that in verse 1. Uh, you have intimately examined me, right? A thorough, intimate examination. But here is, you you have uh, intimately been acquainted with all my ways. We'll see more about this as we go on. But uh, it's very descriptive. And the way that the Lord describes, the Holy Spirit describes this through uh, through David, or David describes it by the Holy Spirit, what God's dealings uh, with him. And the first one in verse 2, where it says, you know my sitting down and my rising up, that's just sort of a metaphorical. Of course, literally, God knows when we sit down and when we rise up, but it's more my comings, my goings, you know, whether I'm sitting, whether I'm standing. Basically, he knows all about me. And you understand my thought afar off. Um, that's not dealing with distance. It's not saying that God is far away and he still knows my thoughts. That's that's not the point here. It, it's it's that um, it's um, he he's familiar with it. You know, he knows it. Right. Uh, before it even. Uh, it really has to do with time before we even have the thought. That's the idea. Before we even have the thought, he knows it. That's what it means when he knows it far, afar off, from afar. It's not just that he's far away, because he's not. Because we'll see here his omnipresence. Uh, David can't get away from God, okay? So it, 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 the distance is not the point. It's It's more like the timing of it, that he knows what we'll think before we think it, right? Again, uh, we see this with um, Simon Peter in the New Testament and with the disciples, how he knew exactly what they were thinking and what they would think. Also with the Pharisees, he knew what they were thinking, what they would think, right? Uh, his omniscience. And then you comprehend my path. We already looked at you scrutinize my path. That sifting, I already mentioned that. My lying down again, and you are acquainted are, are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Okay, so uh, it's lovely to see this, that our God is, is a personal God. Uh, he's not a far off. Uh, he's a God who knows all things and he knows all about us, right? Uh, and he's intimately acquainted with us. And so we go on in this first section, this first section of six verses. Remember, there's four uh, parts here to the psalm and each part has six verses. And so uh, in verse 4, it says, For there is not a word on my tongue. Uh, behold, 
O Lord, you know it altogether. Not only our thoughts, but our words are known by him altogether. In fact, the Darby translation has, for, for there's not yet a word on my tongue, just like my thoughts. He knows them before I think them. He knows my words before I say them. For there's not yet a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, O Jehovah, Yahweh, you know it altogether. And then verse 5, you have hedged me uh, behind and before, and your hand uh, laid your hand uh, upon me. Again, we get this idea of his uh, omniscience and the hedging here could be translated enclosed, you know, and some have translated it this way, you hem me in. You know, we're hemmed in by God's uh, providence uh, and by his omniscience. And we'll see when we come uh, to verse, the second section, verses 7 to 12, how uh, in a low point of David's life, he was thinking, how can I get away from this, right? Uh, I'm hemmed in by these things. And then verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Yeah, uh, there's many things uh, about God and his uh, ability to uh, understand all things and, and deal with the universe, this huge universe that he has created, you know, with the stellar uh, heavens, you know, these great orbs and the intricate work of our solar system, of our planet, of the biological ecosystems, you know, uh, both on land and water, uh, the atmosphere and everything. And then it comes down to the creatures. You know, Job uh, uh, speaks a lot about this. When the Lord revealed himself to Job, he didn't explain to him why he was suffering, but he revealed to him his uh, sovereign power and creation. And... And then also for those who are his own, his believers, how he knows all about us, right? How can that be? You know, Psalm 147, verse 5 is an interesting verse in this connection. Just turn over to Psalm 147 and verse 5. I love this verse. It says, great is our Lord. Here, I believe it's Adonai, our master, and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. His understanding is infinite. That's big, right? God's understanding is infinite. Our understanding is finite. Uh, uh, our understanding is limited. You know, men search these things out. And man, as the crown of God's creation, has been given certain powers, powers of exploration, powers to search out the mysteries of the universe and of creation, can harness some of these powers like the animals can't we harness these powers because we're in the image of God and you know we come up with scientific discoveries and all sorts of things right but really it's just in comparison to God's infinite understanding it's, it's just like a less than a speck of dust what we have and what we understand and just think too um, you know I often think of this you know when you're praying you're praying to God and uh, he's uh, and you you you're believing that he's listening to you and hearing you in your prayers, but then the thought crosses your mind. Yeah, but someone else down the road is praying too at the same time, and someone in the next province or the next state is praying. Not only someone, maybe hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands are praying, and then you know across the country, whether Canada, United States, across the world, millions perhaps are praying to him all at the same time. How can he sort this? Out, you know, I can barely take one conversation with a person at a time. I get very easily distracted. Um, but you know, when you see heaven and you see the, the the worship there and the multitudes and so on, you know, God, God is um, his. Let's just say it. His understanding uh, is infinite. Now, if I was in meeting with you and I was speaking to you in this way, I would I would uh, ask you to to do a public response to that, and we would all say it together. His understanding is infinite. Okay. And so that sort of concludes the first section here, the first six verses, the omniscience of God. And then we come to the second uh, section, uh, the omnipresence of God, that he, he is, he's everywhere. Um, 
And as I mentioned, or alluded to, that you get some hint in this section that uh, perhaps David had gone through a time when, you know, he perhaps wished it wasn't so that God knew everything, you know, and how can I get away from this? And uh, uh, it was, it, uh, the one thing about David is he's very honest in his exercises and his statements and his relationship with the Lord. He's, he's honest to his readers, right? And, and these were meant to be sung originally, most of them. And he's honest to God. And that's a good way to be. God likes honesty. So he says in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Remember Jonah, how he fled from the presence of the Lord? Uh, the Lord told him to go to Nineveh, you know, to those uh, bad old Assyrians, and uh, bring them a message that if they would repent, he would spare them. But uh, Jonah didn't like that idea. He didn't like the Assyrians. They were bad people in his mind. And uh, he knew that, excuse me, he knew that God would uh, repent and, and forgive them if they, uh, or rather relent and forget if they had repented, if they changed their ways, he would, he would not judge them. Jonah knew that and he was worried about that because he wanted them judged, you know. Um, it's a good thing Jonah wasn't the Lord, right? Um, and so he, he fled from the presence of the Lord. He got in a ship. And, um, you know, he was headed to Spain. He was going the wrong way. He was going west when he should have been going northeast to the country today we call Iraq. And we know the story how the fishermen, over uh, the, the sailors overthrew him overboard. And he ended up in the, in, the, in the belly of this great fish. And you can read his description of it there in Jonah. Uh, and much like this, you know, where can I flee from your presence? Right? I tried to flee, but now you're here with me in, in, the, in the belly of the fish. And if I ascend to heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Now I should say, um, hell here is not, it's not a good translation. It's really Sheol. It's not hell in the sense that, you know, the judgment of God that we get in Revelation 20. It's not Gehenna. It's Sheol. That's the place of the departed those that have died and gone beyond, it's not st saying where they are, you know, they're just, uh, essentially, you know, they're just, it's just the place of the departed. And so really what he's speaking here in verse 8 uh, is, is really metaphorical. He's not literally speaking necessarily of heaven and hell. He could be, uh, but the fact he's using it in a sort of a hyperbolic way, you know, if, you know, if I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the Sheol, you're there. He's just making a point here. Uh, and then verse 9, uh, if I take the wings of the morning, okay, or the rays of the morning sun, that's what he's speaking of, the rays of the morning sun that they break across, uh, right? Uh, when the sun shines, uh, you know, like even if I go at the speed of light and try to get away, you're still there. You know, light goes at 186,000 miles per second. Uh, you're still there, Lord. And dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Then verse 10. Even there, it's stressed. Even there, your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. So there, now, it's more positive. It's not fleeing, right? It's that even if I get way out, Lord, and I, you know, I mess up and I feel far away from you. Even there, your hand will hold me. The Lord is so gracious. Right? And if you feel like uh, God is far away, realize that he will hold your hand. Right, He will hold our hand. He will hold our hand and lead me. Verse 10, hold your right hand. Uh, in your right hand shall hold me. The hand of his power is his right hand. And also your hand will lead me. And then Verse 11 and 12, he says, If I say, surely darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Uh, e indeed, uh, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. And notice the very last expression, uh, the darkness and the light are both alike to you. See, the darkness and the light are the same to God. Um, he created the, the night and he created the day 
He created darkness and he created light for us. It, it, it makes no difference to him, right? Darkness or light, these created things. We see in the original creation, he, you know, the sun to rule the day, the moon to rule the night, the stars and so on. There's a, a day and a night. There's a darkness and there's a light. But even uh, beyond the physical creation, you know, the m morally or metaphorically, right? The darkness and the light are both alike to you. It makes no difference to him. Even when we're in the dark and we can't see our way, uh, it's not that he can't see. Uh, I always think of our children when they were little, and, and I've seen it with my grandchildren as well. You know, when they're around two years old um, and the other children are playing hide and seek or you're playing hide and seek with them, uh, they'll they'll close their eyes, right? Because they think if, if you know, they can't see me, uh, if, they, if I can't see them, uh, they can't see me. Uh, and we're like that sometimes, right? If I'm not thinking about God, and if I'm trying to block him out of my mind, and I can't see him, surely then he can't see me. See me. Well, that's not true, right? So sometimes we're just like little children in that way, we, who shut their eyes, and because they can't see anybody else, that means no one else can see them. But it, it, it's all alike to God, right? His omnipresence, his omniscience, and then... His omnipresence. And then we come to the next section, the third section, uh, verse 13 to 18, and there we get his omnipotence, uh, his, his power. He's all powerful. And uh, one of the main things brought before us here is creation, but not just uh, the general creation of the universe or of our planet, but our creation, creation of mankind that he created us. Remember, He's both creator and redeemer, and we emphasize that he's redeemer. Obviously, that's the emphasis for us as believers. Uh, but we see in Revelation chapter 4, uh, he's worshipped because he's the creator. And then in chapter 5, he's worshipped because he's the redeemer. And then in Revelation, I think it's chapter 14, the angel that flies in heaven uh, says, Worship uh, the Lord God, for he has created all things, the heaven and the earth. Um so that's the starting point, is to recognize that he, first of all, is the, the creator, but he's both creator and redeemer. Lovely thought. And so he says in verse 13, For you formed my inward parts, uh, you covered me in my mother's womb. Now, uh, I'm reading again from the, the, the New King James, but covered here, uh, covered means wove, like woven together. Um, we were woven together in, in our mother's womb. And yeah, even in our mother's womb, God is with us. He creates us. And this is why uh, uh, abortion is so wrong, because it's a human life that's in the womb. You know, the Apostle Paul could say in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. So even in his mother's womb, Paul said that God's eye was upon him. God was creating him to be a special vessel for himself. Right? But that's the true also for all of us, uh, uh, that uh, we were in the mother's womb and woven together, right? woven together, um, created by him. You know that word... Some, sometimes used in the New Testament about creation uh, comes from the Greek. There are several different words. Uh, but, for example, in, in Romans uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 20, uh, this is just the general creation, but uh, would include us, mankind. Uh, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes or his divinity are clearly seen, being uh, understood by the things that are made, made there, uh, the word is uh, the Greek word is poema, uh, and I hope I'm getting this right, Jonas, if you're listening over there in Greece. But the original idea of the word way back when was a, a, a work of art, okay? And so uh, we see that in Psalm 19 as well, like it was the, his handiwork, the work of his fingers, an artwork in a sense, you know, because of its complexity and its intricacy and all of these things that we may consider uh, with creation. And then we get the well-known verse, 
of praise in verse 14. I will praise you for uh, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So it's not just creation. It's it's the creation of me, the creation of you. Right? Fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. You know, the human being is the... Uh, as I said earlier, the crown of creation. It's um, uh, m marvelous what God has done with us, of poor pieces of clay. You know, uh, he's given us brains. He's created us in his image. And you think of all the parts, you know, the brain and the eyes, you know, and, you know, the sinews, the muscles and nerves. And it's just, uh, it's just amazing. Um, yet, in many ways, we're very weak, you know. Um, we're marvelously created, fearfully and wonderfully made. But, you know, something can go wrong very easily, too, you know, because it shows the weakness, the mortality that is with mankind. You know, I remember several years back, uh, I had um, was called uh, pulmon pulmonary embolism or emboli, really, it was a multiple. That is uh, blood clots in my lung. And, you know, it's actually a deadly condition. Uh, went for a walk one day and felt sh shortness of breath. And so we went to the hospital. But the doctor said, the specialist said, you know, uh, Brian, you're, well, he, I don't know if you use the word lucky or whatever, but he said, you know, I've had them with that and they just drop dead right in front of me. You know, they're, we're just hanging by a thread, you know. But God's mercy was uh, for me at that time, uh, preserved me for that time. For whatever reason, I'm still here. But um, that's true for all of us in a way, you know, that um, we're, we're sort of hanging by thread. But but God has the thread, right? Our times are in thy hand. And Father, we would wish them there. But nevertheless, we are fearfully and and wonderfully made, you know, um, the... the uh, you think of the uh, human genome, you know, like the, the our DNA composition uh, is very complex. Uh, our system, you know, like the cell structure, all of that, you know, is is it's. We think of DNA, RNA, and all these things way over my head, you know, but it's 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 a chemical language, right? It's like a computer code. But it's a chemical computer code, and each person has their own genetic makeup, their own coding that God has designed. Uh, someone had, and I've written down some of the facts here with that, that uh, if, if you were to take the coding that makes up uh, the human body, right, and put, and put it like end to end, you know, the information, it's information really, uh, it would go from, from the, uh, the distance from the earth to the sun and back. A hundred times, one person, the information that was it was in, in each person is enough information that if it was stretched out uh, end to end somehow. Uh, it would go from the earth to the sun and back a hundred times. Now, uh, the, the earth is 93 million miles away uh, from the sun, or the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. That's 186 million miles times a hundred that's incredible. Or if you put in kilometers, I said the miles for our U.S. friends, but in kilometers, the Earth is 149 uh, million uh, kilometers away from the sun. Uh, uh, and if you do the round trip, okay, back, it's 298 million kilometers away. But then times 100, I didn't bother working out the math there, but it's amazing, you know, in one person. So, we're formed, there's genetic information they're discovering. And the more men discover things like this, the more marvelous it becomes. You wonder why they just don't stop and, and worship God, right? Uh, they used to think that the human cell was just a simple thing. I can even remember that in school back in the 60s, in my first science class. Oh, the human cell, it's just, you know, it's just a simple thing and it has a nucleus, right? But now it's its complex as a whole universe in and of itself. Also, okay. DNA. Uh, uh, how do they say it? what they call it? deoxyribonucleic acid? Deoxyribonucleic acid. 
But so, as someone has said, a better definition of that, uh, that's the scientific definition, of course, but de another definition would be definitely not accidental. Definitely not accidental because information by its very nature is not accidental. It's information. It is telling a story. It's, it's, it's a program. It's a code, right? And so that cannot be accidental. It, otherwise, it would just be random. It would be chaos. It wouldn't be meaning anything. Okay, let's continue on. we we'll spend too long on that. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you. I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Okay, the, the frame here literally in the Hebrew means bones. My bones uh, were made in secret. My bones were formed in my mother's womb. Uh, when it says made in secret, and in the lowest parts of the earth, the lowest parts of the earth is sort of a, a metaphor for the womb, right? Uh, that my bones were created there. Some understand it means that, that we are created from the dust, possibly. But I think the context here is the mother's womb. Uh, and so our bones are formed there. You know, in um, it, just turn to me with me to Ecclesiastes. Just jump over two books, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 11, we get an interesting verse in that connection. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and uh, verse 5. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. I like that. Uh, you don't know uh, how bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. And there's another verse in Job along that line. Job chapter 10. Job's the previous book to the Psalms. So we go back to Job uh, chapter 10 and get over there. Job 10. And... Uh, Verse 9 to 12. I guess verse 11, but we'll start verse 10. Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews? You have granted me life and favor. Your care has preserved my spirit. I like that. And knit together with bones and sinews. And so the... Reading Job and especially Ecclesiastes, how man does not know how this happens. Of course, uh, our medical knowledge today, our scientific knowledge on some of these things is much greater than uh, in Job's day and in the right of Ecclesiastes day. As far as the actual physiology of it, you know, like, you know, how the chemicals work and and how the things function and the whole system how it all works men have have studied this and plotted out that is true okay so the the, the understanding to a certain degree is much greater than it was back then as to the physiology of it but do we still really know how how or why um, we still can't figure that out like we, we they can do the hard science of it but really how does it happen? You know, like it, it's, it's, it's a miracle. And anyone who has been at a at birth of a child, my wife had six and I was there for them. Uh, every time it's the same thing. Oh, wow. This is something. This is a miracle, right? That this little human being comes out, you know, fully formed. So we give thanks to the Lord for that. Okay. So um, now we move on. Well, I should just say, if we come, to, we should really look at verse sixteen. Your eyes uh, saw my substance being yet unformed. In your book, uh, they were all written. Uh, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Now, some understand this verse in connection with the, our our creation, the our, the forming of a person in the womb. That that uh, before they were brought together, you know, uh, they were already written in God's book. But really, the emphasis here is really on the time, on, on our days, once we are born, okay? Once, I'm sorry, once we are born. Uh, if I read it from the um, 
uh, New American Standard Version is a little clearer there. Uh, verse 16 puts it this way. Uh, your eyes have seen my unformed substance and then semicolon. You know, in the original Hebrew and Greek, there was no punctuations, right? So it depends on context and the translator. So your eyes have seen my unformed substance. So we're just dealing with our the forming in the womb. But then the thought ends, semicolon. Then, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained from me when there was yet uh, when as yet there was not one of them. So the reference of the days that are ordained for us, the Lord knew them uh, before we were born, our days, what all our days would contain. Uh, the reference here is, is to our life, right? To the, the days of our life and everything that we will do. Um, I'll read over here from a, a paraphrase. Again, uh, it's not the literal translation, but it helps us really to understand, to get the sense of the literal of the Hebrew it says, you saw me before I was born, period. They put a period there. Then, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Now, that's a paraphrase, but that gives the idea. Before a single day had passed, every day of my life was recorded in your book. That's amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, the word of God, you know. Um, and so now we come to the, the last section here, the last section of six verses, um, and it's a, it's a prayer. It's David's response to these things. Uh, he says in verse 17, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Now, some people understand this verse in different ways, but the best way to understand this verse when it says, How precious also are your thoughts you should say about me or concerning me. Some translations will give that as a footnote just for clarity. That uh, it, it, the preciousness is to the is to the saint. You know um, uh, that they are precious uh, to us. Right. Uh, all the things that God has has done for us ought to be precious. Uh, the word precious here really means esteemed or prized, right? All of God's ways with us ought to be esteemed by us and prized by us as we discover them in the Word of God. Because the Word of God, the Bible gives us a revelation of who He is and His dealings with us, okay? Creation can only tell us so much. Uh, but the true book of Revelation, the, the inspired scripture, gives us all the intimate details and of his relationship with his creatures. He's Jehovah Yahweh. He has a relationship with us as creator, also as redeemer, but the emphasis more in Psalm 139 is, is more as, as creator and his providential care over us rather than um, salvation as such. But he's speaking about those who are saved, who, are, who he has redeemed, right? His saints. So how esteemed, how prized, prized are your thoughts about me or concerning me how great is the sum of them if i should count them they would be more than the number of the sand have you ever tried to count all the sand um, when i awake uh, i am still with you when i am awake i'm still actually i'm still on the third section here i haven't got to the 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 prayer i'm sorry the prayer really starts in verse 19 uh this is an explanation, verse 17, an exclamation, explanation uh, of praise from David, right? He's exclaiming, how precious are all your thoughts to me. But verse 17 and 18 actually are the conclusion of the third section. I'm sorry, a little misled you there, but uh, are the conclusion of the third section uh, about the wonders of, of God's creation of our, of our bodies and so on, Okay. Um, and then he concludes the section in verse 18 with these words, when I am awake, I am still with you. That goes along with what we've had previously. When I am awake, I am still with you. And I've often thought of this verse, you know, from a personal perspective, because, you know, some of you know my testimony, how uh, I was saved rather dramatically and uh, the Lord delivered me and saved me, you know, and this is not everybody's testimony. I know some were brought up in the, in the uh, uh, Christian home 
and believed in the Lord as a young person, that's fine. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. You were preserved from things. Um, my testimony is different. You know, I was a, a total unbeliever, you know, a wicked person, really. And, and the Lord Jesus revealed himself to me. Uh, and it was a dramatic change. And even though I couldn't explain it, all I knew really at the beginning it was that it was Jesus that did it, right? I couldn't, I had to read the Bible later. As I read the Bible later, then I found out what happened to me that, that it, they, the Bible calls it being born again, okay? But one thing I felt, if I can say it that way, was that uh, he was with me, right? There's something new. It wasn't there before. He was with me. The presence of God was with me at that time, right from that day, as soon as I realized that it was the Lord Jesus, okay? And the psalmist says, when I wake, I am still with you, right? Um, he is still with me. And I remember, you know, how waking up for a week or two after that, each morning I wake up, just seeing, you know, <laughs> is it still there? Is he still there? Yes, he's still with me. And I'm still with him. And I can say, now, after 48 years, and I'm going to, I'm not, I don't want to go too much with feelings here because we have to base things on the Word of God, but I'm just speaking from personal testimony and experience that I'm still with Him and He is still with me. And so just, I just say that there's nothing about me here, but just the magnify of the Lord's grace. It's the same for you too, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we get the final section now, the fourth section of six verses that's verse 19 to 24 um and it's a prayer as i mentioned it's a prayer and the first part of the prayer is what we call an imprecatory prayer that is an imprecation is when you call for judgment upon someone or something okay and this is what i said at the outset is that there are some things in the psalms that is not really christian ground as such right we don't call for the judgment of our enemies. So let's just read it first. Verse 19 down to verse 22. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do not I loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a, a perfect hatred, or that can mean a complete hatred. I count them my enemies, okay? Um, you know, we see in Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation, uh, the Jewish uh, martyrs in the Great Tribulation, the Jewish remnant, under the fifth seal in chapter 6, uh, they say, uh, Revelation verse 10, they cry with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? See, that's perfectly right for the Jewish remnant in future day to call upon the Lord for judgment of their enemies upon the earth, just as they do here in the Psalms. But the Christian, you know, the, if the enemy smites you on the cheek, you give him also the other cheek. We're, this is the Christian dispensation. So we have to rightly divide the word of truth in that way to know our relationship with God and our particular responsibilities that uh, become us in the dispensation in which we find ourselves. And it would be out of place for a Christian to call for judgment upon his enemies. Rather, we pray for them, right? And we present the gospel to them. So just keep that in mind when you read the Psalms. And then uh, he turns from the uh, imprecation of the imprecatory prayer now uh, to the conclusion in verse 23, 24. It sort of brings him back to the beginning because he says, uh, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Now the first verse, opening verse, is God you have searched me. Uh, and now he's, uh, through his exercises of soul and so on, he's he's continuing and he's saying, now God, continue, you know, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And that word there, thoughts, can be translated cares or anxieties. Uh, the Darby translation uh, has it this way, uh, my anxious or conflicting thoughts. I mean, we all have had conflicting thoughts. We have conflicting thoughts every day, right? Uh, search me and know me, 
try me and know my conflicting thoughts, O oh God, or my anxious. That's the same idea, apparently, in the Hebrew. Anxious or conflicting thoughts. My anxieties, the New King James uh, translates it. The uh, New American Standard has um, my anxious thoughts, but it has a footnote similar here to the Darby translation. So try me and know my anxieties, know my cares. Some translation translated that way, my cares. Uh, or my conflicting thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Now that word wicked is important here. Um, I mean, it can be translated grievous way. If there's any grievous way in me, and the Darby translation has a footnote or idolatrous way. It may have the idea of idolatry. So it's a way, you see, speaking, speaking about that, see if there be any tendency in me. You know, that's what we have to watch for, brother and sister. We may not be, uh, you know, out and out sinning or, you know, falling into out and out idolatry. And a Christian can fall into idolatry when he replaces God with something else, right? The place that God should have, something else comes in. You know, the Apostle John says in his, his epistle, uh, chapter 5, verse 21, uh, little children... Keep yourselves from idols. But here the psalmist is speaking about the way. Before we ever get there, right? Lord, see if there be any way like that in me, any tendency if I drift in a certain way. Uh, the reason why is that we can confess it and judge it. The idea here is examination for self-judgment, to judge ourselves. Paul says if we judge ourselves, the Lord will not have to. Judges of believers. He will not have to bring his discipline upon us if we self-judge, right? So self-judgment is the thought. Uh, and then he concludes with, and lead me in the way everlasting. It's the other way. To keep on the path, right? Not get on the detours and bypass. The way everlasting or the everlasting way. Um, that's, you know, one of the few expressions of eternal life that we get in the Old Testament you know, life and incorruptibility came to light through the gospel. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, I think it's verse 10 or verse 9. Uh, life and incorruptibility came to light through the gospel. But uh, we do get the resurrection in the Old Testament. And we do get eternal life in the Old Testament. Um, there's not a lot of verses, but there's a few. This is one of them. For example, Psalm 133 is another one. Psalm 133, verse uh, three, that is uh, the last verse of Psalm 133. Excuse me, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded blessing, the blessing, life forevermore. So eternal life, that's what we have. As believers, we have eternal life. Uh, we're in that, uh, that everlasting way now. Lord, judge, let me judge myself. If there are tendencies that uh, take me off my path. The Christian, as I said, doesn't lose his salvation. But uh, know me, search me, that I may judge, that I may confess, that I may keep my eyes on the goal that is before me, that is the Lord Jesus, uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory and eternal life. So we bless the Lord for, for his word and uh, pray that you would have a blessed Lord's Day, the rest of your Lord's Day. May the Lord be with you and keep you and um, and uh, we just give thanks for, for his goodness. Amen.